Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Institute for letting me come. I pray that the Spirit will be here to help me say the right things and help you to understand them. I'm joking when I tell them the reason I believe in God is because someone gave me a sugar cookie when I was a little boy. But that's actually the truth. Let me begin. So I'm reading this going to read just a little bit of page 10. Christmas is days away. The Secret Ward is having its annual party. The folding chairs are stacked along the walls. Everyone mingles and dances. I am a sheep in the Nativity program. Toward the end of the evening, everyone is given a sugar cookie. I can't believe my good fortune. I get one, just like everyone else. My cookie is huge and covered with pink frosting. I bite into it how rich and sweet. Its generous taste confirms to me, as the primary song goes, that I am a child of God. Even members of my family, even me, what a joy to know that the people of Sigurd are my brothers and sisters. The members of the Sigurd War <coughs> were not wealthy people. They made their living as workers in a wallboard factory or as farmers or ranchers. But in their common poverty, they made a point of giving everyone a valuable gift. To them, it didn't matter that at our home we ate rice instead of bread, and that my parents brewed a few cups of coffee every morning. They thought of us as one of them, and what my family lacked, they offered. The taste of that cookie was indescribable. It was sweet. It had umami. I imagine it was something like the fruit that Lehi tasted in his dream about human destiny. And it came to pass that I, that I did go forth and partake of the fruit thereof. And I beheld that it was most sweet above all that I ever before tasted. And as I partook, of the fruit thereof, it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy, for I knew that it was desirable above all other fruit. Because in my mind that cookie was this same fruit, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I have spent my entire life remembering and thinking about it. So what are my thoughts about this cookie? First of all, it was a gift. It didn't just come to me, it was a result of someone's thoughtfulness and effort. Second, my cookie was like everyone else's. The sisters of Sigurd didn't make small cookies for kids and big cookies for grown-ups. They didn't make white cookies for white people and colored cookies for colored people. All the cookies were equally generous. I like to think that they all tasted the same. But here, we have to ask a question. How do you know that your cookie tastes like everyone else's? Phenomenologically speaking, my cookie probably did taste different to me, since taste depends on the taster as much as on the thing being tasted. The thing, but that being the case, even if I were to scientifically sample everyone else's cookie, I still wouldn't know if the taste of those samples perfectly matched up with a similar set of samples as experienced by someone else. In other words, our ability to understand true things is limited, but our appreciation of them could be unlimited. 
The years passed and my understanding of <clears throat> this cookie deepened and I came to see that the generous cookie came to me because a man named Jesus made himself into a gift to be shared by all of them. He died so that we might know how to live generously, fully, like him, critical of the, of the divide between Jew and Samaritan, Jew and Roman, Jew and Jew. I came to see the cookie as an emblem, as a symbol of God's love. But the point I would like to make this afternoon is that I have more recently come to understand, and this is important, that my cookie was not a symbol. My cookie made me think, and still makes me think, of certain ideas. It was representational in that sense. But it really was a cookie, just like Jesus really was and is Jesus. He is, as you and I are, visible and material as a sugar cookie. Part two. So far so good? Yeah. <laughs> Why is it important not to say that my cookie was a symbol of God's love? I spent the last three years researching symbols. Symbols are useful. But in some ways, symbols are not our friends. Symbols do their work by making us think we share their meaning when we often don't. For example, flags are symbols. This is the parade in Gunnison. A flag goes down the street. We all pay our respect. We think we share its meaning. But if asked one by one, what the flag means to us personally, we would all give different answers. Symbols encourage us to presume we agree, and it is this presumption of agreement that makes the massiveness of modern society possible. By massive, I mean many people coming together, united in what is perceived to be a common cause. Without symbolic expression, Millions of people would not have been willing to march off to war, for example. Without symbols, people would not form into political parties. They would not join this or that religion. Symbols are useful. But the downside is that this inclusiveness, this presumption, this nature of the symbol, order, symbolic order, invites dishonesty and deception, and coercion. In response to a call to action that he read in James, if you want to know the answer to your question, you ask it. Joseph Smith went into the woods to pray. He asked a modern question. Which of the many churches contending for his attention was the true church? As you know, Joseph got an answer to his question, but, the, but it was anything but a modern and symbolic answer. The answer he received was, the visit of two gods, physical beings, visible, who spoke to him directly and knew him by name. Now in the year 1820, the modern world was already well into the process of this rejecting God. Modernity is secular in orientation, a fact that we as believing people sometimes forget in our desire to be socially acceptable. In some ways, modern technologies have aided the growth of the church, but in other ways, modern values have made it difficult for people to embrace any kind of faith. Unfortunately, we often feel compelled to be modern, but one thing to note is that the God that was being rejected in Joseph Smith's day was largely a symbolically expressed concept. Aristotle, Augustine, 
Aquinas and a host of other Western thinkers had helped turn God into a singular, invisible, distant, male concept. By Joseph Smith's day, God was an abstraction about which many speculated and spoke. But when given the opportunity to speak for himself, Jesus told Joseph Smith, they draw to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. In other words, although Jesus is a person with powers of his own, he had been made into yet another idea for Enlightenment thinkers to consider, to critique, and to appropriate. What was Jesus talking about when he said that the various sects of Christianity vying for Joseph's attention had, quote, a form of godliness, end of quote. Today I would like to argue that the form of godliness they had, and still largely have, is symbolic form. By symbolic form, I mean the theories, laws, principles of the divine that explains, explain God's nature and man's relationship to that nature. Various religions had originated by way of these theological forms, each emphasizing this or that conceptual difference from each other. But the point of the first vision was that these mediating notions were, quote, commandments of men, end quote, rather than personal communication with the gods. Their symbolic expression allowed a par paradoxical drawing near that made hearts distant rather than close. As modernity progressed, the symbolic order that we call religion was supplanted by humanism. The modern appropriation of God made man the measure of all things. Man rejected, I mean, excuse me, hum, man rejected God, but was able to slip into God's vacated chair. And from that elevated position, high above everyone else, symbols spewing men, rain with blood and terror over the year. Their answer to sectarian war was total war, the absolute savagery of which the Book of Mormon eloquently speaks. Too bad we don't understand the Book of Mormon better than we do. Its warnings could not be more relevant today. Today, this choicest above all lands is cursed. The earth mourns and the gods weep. We are cursed with drought and fire, flood and disease. We are cursed with obscene wealth and persistent poverty. We live in a time when the hearts of men and women are proud and we have no peace. Today is the generosity of the sugar cookie anywhere to be found? Where is our peace? Where is Zion? Where is the delicious joy of God's love? Joseph Smith's vision began a marvelous work in a wonder. Yet, so far, our various attempts to establish Zion have largely failed. The saints gathered to Kirkland. They turned to Missouri, then to Nauvoo. They built homes of red brick and left them behind. For a long while, we thought, surely, Utah is Zion. But now, clearly and sadly, we see that even the valleys of the mountains are troubled and as divided as the rest of the world. My brothers and sisters, as bad as things are, we have reason to hope. We have reason to rejoice because the modern context of our faith is growing weaker. Some of us lament the present postmodern confusion, but maybe we shouldn't. Why? Because of Joseph's vision, the restoration, a recouping of all things, of primitive things, began. When, see, when seen in historical context, the rise of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has not been yet another modern reformation, 
of the symbolic order. The restoration is not meant to be another symbolic drawing to near God with our lips rather than with our hearts. Rather, the restoration is a postmodern renewal of man's personal, poetic, physical relationship with long forgotten gods and also with, I hasten to say, a forgotten earth that was created for our use and stewardship. The purpose of this use and stewardship is the establishment of Zion. How then will we know we have fulfilled the purpose of Earth's creation? In Moses, we find the familiar description. And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. We will not become his people until we embrace a new non-modern, non-symbolic understanding of Zion. Zion is not built above, nor does it stand with hills surrounding. For us today, Zion is here, wherever we are. Zion is Zen. We do not need anywhere to go to ask the question, what does it mean to be of one heart and one mind, to live in righteousness with no poor among us? Wherever two are gathered in his name, the Spirit, God is burning like a fire. Today we are gathered here in this room, but do we have unity and peace? Are there poor among us? Part three. <clears throat> in my lifetime, it's gotten much harder to achieve unity because in my lifetime, the modern period ended and something else began around the year 1970. In the good old modern times, unity could be expressed and felt more simply, not because people were any better back then, but because the glue of society was expressed differently. It was expressed symbolically. Again, symbols are good at encouraging cooperation because they tempt us to assume agreement but the value of symbols is the problem with symbols. They make massive social groupings possible, such as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But they accomplish this by way of a false sense of one heart and one mind. Is Zion a symbol of unity? Does the priesthood reside with us symbolically? We might as well ask if God is a symbol. I want to make the hopeful argument today that the peace of Zion is, like God, physical and real and honest. Peace is a sugar cookie, a loaf of bread. Peace is the handle on the door of the church. Peace is a kiss on the lips. Peace is the spirit as it fills us time and time again with energy, inspiration, and a softening of heart. Peace is the white linen that covers the bread and the water. You might ask, aren't the bread and water symbols of God? But answer me this, is bread, bread? Is water, water? Is Jesus, Jesus? He is not an idea. He is not way over there while we are way over here. He is someone to argue with not about. Some of us, myself included, will want to battle Aquinas with theology, but it makes more sense for Latter-day Saints to be writing memoirs. As President Nelson recently reminded us, our relationship with Jesus has never before been as, quote, personally vital and relevant, end of quote. Why vital? Because bread is alive, because water is alive because Jesus is alive, because you are alive. We all have anima. What is anima? Anima is, is the spirit that all things have. Everything has an anima, even things we don't usually think of as having a spirit or intelligence. God's creations have a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect. It is the combining of those two that is the very purpose and poesis of mortality. 
with their gift of a sugar cookie. The sisters with sugar taught me that Zion is not yet another modern form of godliness. Rather, it is exactly godliness. Zion is a place of life, a place of generosity and love where people, gods, and things fulfill their divine destiny by way of what President Nelson calls the personally vital. Zion does not happen symbolically. One heart and one mind might sound like modern slogans. Fascists love expressions like a million hearts beating as one. But what stops the form of godliness and the commandments of men and the unrighteous dominion from smothering our chances of establishing Zion is the more concrete phrasing, and there was no poor among them. Peace comes when we are, like the members of the Sigurd Board, making sugar cookies for everyone. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And Jesus answered them, Give them something to eat. Part four. This is the last one. Have you ever tasted God's love? Have you forgotten it? As sweet and as delicious as God's love is, it can be forgotten. As a way to help others remember love, God's love, I decided to write my memories of forgetting. As contained in Zion, Earth, and Sky, one, remember, one memory in particular fills me with horror. But I want to read it to you because it helps me make my point today about sugar cookies. Summer drags on, Charles is miserable. He is not just unhappy, he's depressed. There's something physically wrong with me as well. My, I start getting boils all over my body. I catch a virus and I end up in the hospital. Life becomes terribly out of balance. Something is missing. Nothing motivates me. None of my goals mean anything anymore. I realize that I have misunderstood God, that I've used up all my energy for the wrong reasons. I was given a golden opportunity, but I blew it. I realize I have nothing to live for. 